Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the SIIC Malaysia webinar, The Interplay Between Arbitration and Insolvency, Perspectives from Malaysia and Singapore. My name is Suen, SIIC's Business Development Manager Legal, and I'm pleased to be your MC. Some housekeeping matters. If you're applying for CPD points, please ensure that you remain logged on for the entire session. You may send your questions to the panelists using the Q&A function. As we have limited time, the panelists will try their best to address as many questions as possible. Our panelists for today's webinar are Mr. Andrew Chan, partner of Ellen Gladhill LLP, Mr. David Chan, partner of Shuklin and Bob LLP Singapore, Ms. Shopna Chandra, partner of Danton's Rodike and Davidson LLP, Mr. Lee Ing Bing, SC, Senior Partner of Raja and Tan Singapore LLP, Mr. Leong Wai Hong, Partner of Screen, and Mr. Ravindra S. Nathan, Partner of Shen Delamore and Co. Moderating this session is Ms. Angela Yap, Counsel of SIC. Over to you, Angela. Thank you, Sue Ann. Thank you all for joining us today uh, for this session. I'm very pleased to announce that we have 539 signups. And the majority of you are from Singapore, Malaysia, the US, India, UK, and Indonesia. We're extremely um, grateful for your support and we're very happy to have you here with us today. So uh, a very warm welcome to our panel, panel speakers as well. Um, just to give a short introduction for this session today um, as, a, as, a, as a starting point, um, at SIEC, we're seeing a lot more insolvency elements on our cases since the pandemic has started. Um, it could be an actual insolvency proceeding or even threatened insolvency proceedings. So we see parties either becoming insolvent or liquidators of insolvent companies being involved in pursuing claims in arbitrations. We're also seeing a lot of settlements on our cases, which we suspect could possibly be driven by cash flow or insolvency insol issues. So either way, um, all these have some impact on the progress of the ongoing arbitration proceedings. Um, so in today's session, we will focus on the interaction between insolvency and arbitration, both in Malaysia and in Singapore. So generally, when an insolvency proceeding has been commenced um, in Malaysia and Singapore, I, I, as far as I understand, both jurisdictions require leave of court to be obtained before one can continue or commence any actions, including arbitration proceedings. So that's obviously would have a direct effect on arbitrations, either within the jurisdiction of the insolvency proceeding itself. Uh, but the position is less clear um, on arbitrations that are seated outside of the jurisdiction where the insolvency proceedings has been commenced. So that, I mean, that being said, there are other practical considerations that parties should bear in mind um, when they're in an arbitration. Uh, that they should take into account if the counterparty undergoes an insolvency proceeding or some form of restructuring arrangement. So we're very honored today to have our panelists here. They are all specialists either in arbitration or insolvency or both um, coming from both Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, this is a very wide topic uh, as our internal discussions with panelists have shown. It, there are so many things we could talk about and we could go on for days. Uh, but we know we only have an hour. So what we will do is we'll focus on three main areas uh, for this particular session. We will first look at some of the issues that could arise uh, that are common um, in arbitration and insolvency. We will then look at the effects of insolvency on a party's claim and on ongoing arbitrations. And finally, we hope the panelists will share with us some of the practical or strategic steps that a party could take or think about when your counterparty is undergoing insolvency or restructuring. So that's generally what we will be speaking about today. So participants, you are very much welcome to submit your question uh, using the Q&A function you will see on your screen. Um, as mentioned before, we only have one hour, so we will try our best to address them as we go along during the session or even at the end of the, of the session. So please bear with us. Now let's get the ball rolling. Um, I will start with Shopna. Can you just briefly share with us to you, what to you is the interplay between insolvency and arbitration? What are some of the common issues that typically would crop up? Well, th thank you, for, um, you know, firstly for inviting me to speak um, and the very kind introduction 
uh, as an expert on arbitration and insolvency. I'm still, uh, uh, you know, learning as, as, as we all are. So uh, read that qualification, <laughs> moving on to the substance of it. I think we can look at it uh, from two perspectives. Um, insolvency claims generally are not uh, arbitrable. I think that's very clear. Uh, in Singapore, we have a uh, case law at the court of appeal level that actually makes clear that um, you, you are not able to arbitrate uh, insolvency claims because there are underlying public uh, interest considerations uh, which uh, disallow this. So that part is not controversial. The slightly more uh, controversial or, or newer development um, relates to when you can commence uh, insolvency proceedings where the parties have an arbitration clause uh, in the contract between them. So I think you can uh, probably tell that I'm alluding to the VTB case uh, and we will cover that in more detail uh, later on as we progress. Uh, but in essence for the second uh, topic, there are certain uh, minor exceptions, but largely speaking, um, you know, generally speaking, when you have an arbitration clause, you have to really think twice, thrice uh, based on the current case law in Singapore before you go ahead. So these are the two key aspects to my mind. Anything to add, David, from Singapore's perspective? Um, I, I think it's very interesting what Shopna said about um, the about thinking many times before. I think she said think twice before um, a liquidator or an insolvency professional decides to uh, commence an action or even defend a proceeding, I think. Um, I, I think that the, the biggest um, difficulty, I suppose, is it really depends on when the arbitration commences. I mean, if the arbitration commences before the insolvency proceeding, if the arbitration commences after the insolvency proceeding, and what are the effects of it? And for example, I mean, if, if there is indeed insolvency proceedings afoot, um, how do you uh, persuade the court, for example, that the arbitration should continue as opposed to availing yourself of the proof of debt dispute resolution procedure? Um, and I think, and I'm only signposting things, um, but I think the other thing to also consider is uh, the assignment or assignment of rights and whether the right to arbitrate or the burden to arbitrate um, can be assigned. And I mean, I think that that's been made clear by the Singapore courts at least that um, an arbitration agreement is assigned together with the entire contract um, at initial. So there are different there are issues then I suppose that arises as to whether um, in an insolvency, for example, whether there is a sale or purchase of um, debts and whether the arbitration then, or the duty to arbitrate then flows with that. Um, but I, I, think, I think for practical purposes, it really very much depends on when the arbitration was commenced. Prior to the liquidation or prior to the insolvency um, proceeding, while the proceedings are afoot and how do you then deal with a dispute um, that arises in the course of the insolvency proceeding as to whether, um, like I said, whether one then avails itself of the proof of that dispute resolution procedure or whether one goes to arbitration. And I mean, even, even for that, I mean, there, there is case law in Singapore and in Takanaka, which suggests that you continue with arbitration, but those are those are limited to its facts. So I can't say that it's a, it's a general <laughs> principle to be applied. Yes, the big question is um, how, how do, how, what's the best way to deal with the dispute depending on when the insolvency happens and whether arbitration is already afoot, right? Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll delve into that further later on, but can I also hear from the Malaysian perspective on this particular point, Mr. Leong, do you have any Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Angela. Uh, in actually in Malaysia, the the, the issue as is to whether insolvency re related claims are arbitrable is still, in my mind, open issue. Uh, I say it's an open issue because uh, uh, we only have a high court decision on this matter. Uh, there's no apex 
decision yet. Uh, so let me just share a recent decision that was just delivered in September last year by the Malaysian High Court. It's the Uda Land, Sindian Bahat and Puncak Sepakat case. Uh, it's a decision uh, by Justice Lin Chong Fong, uh, formerly a top construction lawyer who has now become a judge. So basically what happened in, in that case was that uh, Uda Land, the developer, awarded a contract to the main contractor, Punchak, to build a housing estate. So midway through the project, Punchak went into liquidation, compulsory liquidation. So then the developer Uda Land terminated the contract and appointed another contractor. Subsequently, Punchak then filed a claim against the Uda Land uh, for the work that was done by them. And Uda Land applied to the Malaysian court for leave to file a counterclaim. So matters went before the arbitrator because the Punchak's claim was based on the arbitration clause in the construction contract. So, so before the arbitrator, you have got a claim from Puncha and you have a counterclaim uh, from Uda Land. The counterclaim was based on uh, statutory insolvency uh, set off under Section 41 of the Malaysian Bankruptcy Act, which actually say that when you have such a situation, when, when a company is in bankruptcy, you do a setting up of, of accounts. So matters went before the arbitrator, AISC, the arbitrator held that he had no jurisdiction to deal with the counterclaim. He said that notwithstanding parties' agreement whatsoever, he has no jurisdiction when it's not conferred. It's not conferred on him. So the award was made in favor of Puncha, and then Uda then went to High Court to set aside the award uh, on breach of natural justice. And the learned High Court judge agreed with Uda Lang and held that the arbitrator heard. This is what the High Court judge said. He said, the judge, I find that the learner arbitrator was wrong in finding that he neither have the jurisdiction nor power to determine the plaintiff counterclaim. It is certainly not provided in section 41 of the Bankruptcy Act that mutual set off must be dealt only by the winding up court or the liquidator. So that's where you have the, the holding of the High Court judge. The matter is going to be litigated at the Malaysian Court of Appeal this year. No date is fixed yet, but it will be litigated. So I think as far as the Malaysian perspective is concerned, I, I, I think Singapore is settled. You mentioned there's a Court of Appeal case, Singapore case. But I think as far as Malaysia is concerned, any practitioner will have to be very careful in giving advice as to the strategy and tactics when it comes to this issue, because it is still an open issue. That's all, Angela, I can share on the Malaysian perspective. Uh, Thank you. Rabin, anything to add? Uh, yes, I think it was ironic that in the uh, Udaland case, the, the, the judge set, it aside, set aside the award on natural justice grounds because the arbitrator didn't deal with the counterclaim and set off as um, Wai Hong has mentioned. But the judge didn't approach the matter in terms of arbitrability, whereas it seemed the arbitrator had that sort of reference in mind uh, in deciding that he wasn't able to deal with it. Because as you know, you wouldn't want to deal with any subject matter that is not arbitrable because your award eventually will be liable to be set aside uh, when it comes to a setting aside stage. So the arbitrator was careful, but nevertheless, he was held to have been wrong. Um, so I guess I would, I would uh, share and endorse uh, Wai Hong's view that one needs to be careful and in Malaysia, one cannot take it for granted that um, uh, the position that seems to be settled in Singapore would apply uh, as a matter of course in, in, in Malaysia. And then also I, 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 note, uh, I noted that there was a, a relatively recent English decision in a case called Nori Holdings, in which um, the, the judge referred to Justice VK Raja's uh, decision in Larson and two parts of that judgment, which 
uh, indicated that there's a presumption as a matter of construction that insolvency related claims do not fall within the arbitration agreement, notwithstanding that language might seem to extend to it. Uh, the judge uh, in the High Court in, the, in England held that to the extent that there is this presumption, it doesn't form part of English law and there was no such a presumption under English law. And the subject matter of the case uh, there, which concerned an avoidance claim uh, that arose under Russian law, was allowed to go to, to arbitration. So I, I think very much so, I agree with Wai Hong. In Malaysia, it's still up for argument as to where the line is to be drawn on these matters. With just a follow-up question following on that, would, uh, would Malaysian courts find Sing the Singapore decisions or courts approach persuasive if this issue does come up? I, I think so. Um, if, if uh, there's a case that I will come on to later on in this webinar, uh, the Arch reinsurance case, where our federal court, the highest court has applied uh, and have taken on board a number of statements from Larson and also in the subsequent Singapore Court of Appeal decision. So I think that that gives you an indication that because of the similarity between our legislative frameworks on insolvency and also to, to a large degree on arbitration, we do take, our courts do take uh, Singapore decisions very much as persuasive. Thank you, Robin. Um, let's move on to the next part. I think David has very- Angela, Angela yes. can I just, just add one thing? Uh, I, uh, I just want to add to what Robin has said. Uh, Robin is correct in saying that it's still in a state of flux. The, the reason is actually because in the Uda line case, the, the Larson oil case that Rabin mentioned, the Singapore Court of Appeal decision was not cited to the Malaysian High Court. Uh, it is not referred to in the, in the grounds of decision because as Rabin rightly said, the issue of whether it was arbitrable was not raised as an issue uh, before the High Court, if I, if I, if I read the grounds uh, correctly. So, so the High Court decided on the points raised only by counsel uh, litigating in the party's concern. That's all on this point. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, so following from that, let's move on to the next part. Uh, David has very nicely put it earlier that the, the main issue for insolvency and arbitration at this point is the timing of when the arbitration commences and also the insolvency proceedings. So let's first deal with the effect of an insolvency proceeding on a claim a party has a claim and they're looking at commencing it, uh, commencing an arbitration pursuant to an arbitration agreement. So Shopna has earlier talked about the Singapore Court of Review case of An An Group versus BTB Bank. Uh, we are very uh, honored to have counsel on both ends. Uh, on this panel today, we have Ing Bing and Shopna, uh, whom I'm sure will share a lot of insights from, from their experience from the case. Um, the case of Anand Group and VT Bank effectively resolved a controversy on the standard of review for winding up applications premised on disputed debt, which is subject to arbitration. So uh, maybe I'll invite Ing Bing first to uh, share with us what he thinks is the significance of this decision, especially relating to how parties should pursue their claims. Um, thank you, Angela. Uh... Actually, the Anand -an decision should be read with uh, another decision of the Court of Appeal called BWF and BWG, because exactly the same issue came up in two appeals. And in fact, I remember that day, uh, Anand -an was heard in the morning and BWF was heard in the afternoon. Um, and it just so happened that it was uh, in the decision of Anand -an that the Court of Appeal decided to lay down the law for Singapore. And then in, in the subsequent decision, they just applied it. Um, so, it, what, what's interesting is that if you look at these two cases, um, you know, step back a bit and, and, and look, it's, it's really the law of liquidation catching up with the world of arbitration. Um, because way before arbitrations were popular or were widely used, there was a very well-established uh, defense to a winding up application, which is a border fide dispute uh, on substantial grounds. 
and and that that was sort of uh, 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 sort of entrenched in, in many many years of case law. And then when the the days of arbitration came, you know somehow everyone just assumed that look it's the same test, right? Because there's an uh, and 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 sort of um, did not really. Uh, analyze the situation somewhat differently because of an arbitration agreement uh, in the in the contract between the company and the purported creditor, and and and, and therefore the, 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 there was some divergence, um, and and then the law of uh, arbitration developed such that it was clear that um, in order to to stay court proceedings uh, relating to a claim which is governed by an arbitration agreement. All that um, the the applicant had to show was that there was a prima facie uh, a dispute which was covered by by arbitration and that was enough. But the cases hearing winding up applications didn't really take that on board and there were some cases still applying uh, a, a bona fide substantial dispute. And and therein lies the you know the the, the background uh, uh, against which I think the Singapore courts um, uh, went both ways. Right, so so there, 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 there was a, a case that that uh, um, accepted that the applicable standard is in fact the same as in a stay of court proceedings. No difference between stay of court proceedings or stay of winding up proceedings. In fact, if you look at it, winding up proceedings in some scenarios are more draconian than court proceedings. Um, um, and and that was that was the BWF position. Um, and then in An An in the High Court. Uh, the High Court went the other way, uh, although the High Court did also favour the prima facie standard. The High Court felt that it was bound by an earlier Singapore Court of Appeal decision called Metal Form, and felt that it had to apply Metal Form, and it interpreted Metal Form as applying a triable issue standard. So, so the High Court in An An applied the triable issue standard, found on the facts that there was no triable issue. Um, and, and also actually uh, applied the prima facie standard as well and said, well, even if I apply the prima facie standard, there is still no, uh, there is still no cause for, for uh, dismissing the winding up. Um, and, and that decision went up to the Court of Appeal. Then in the meantime, B, BWF went against the applicant for a winding up because the, the, the judge there applied the uh, prima facie standard. And um, the 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 creditor or purported creditor there then applied to the court of appeal, and therefore you have uh, one decision going one way and another decision going another way, and then the court of appeal basically had to consider everything and say, look, look, okay, right, this is the law, and so if you read the decision in An An, it was basically quite a wide uh, 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 review of case law. Uh, they looked at uh, English decision, which was prima facie. They looked at the uh, East Caribbean Court of Appeal. They looked at uh, Malaysia court, uh, 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 which which um, seems to to follow the prima facie standard. I think they cited a case called Awangsa against Maryland Avenue, uh, but that, uh, that's a high court decision. Um, and then in in they looked at Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, there is some uh, uh, volatility there uh, because for for a while this approach called the last Moss approach uh, was was uh, favored, uh, and the last Moss approach was. Uh, a very very pro arbitration uh, uh, um, approach, uh, but subsequent cases uh, uh, in the Hong Kong Court of Appeal sort of um, um, the, the Court of Appeal in Hong Kong uh, expressed some reservations on that. But anyway, the the Singapore Court of Appeal considered everything and then they say, well, the law for Singapore is the prima facie standard of review. Why? Uh, firstly, because there has to be coherence in the law, and there's good reason to have coherence in the law because. If you're going to apply that standard for state or court proceedings, no reason why it should be any different for winding up proceedings. Uh, number two, there is really no conflict in this context between the insolvency regime and the arbitration regime because we are talking about a pre-insolvency dispute. We're talking about pre-insolvency claim. And if you, if you are dealing with pre-insolvency claims, there's no reason why parties' agreement to arbitrate uh, shouldn't be upheld. And then uh, thirdly, they, 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 they again uh, um, say that party autonomy in this case is important and they're trying to give a, a, a weight to that. And lastly, they said, well, certain, uh, certainty and savings in cost for litigants uh, were also a consideration. So, so basically they say, well, prima facie standard of review then uh, uh, is the law in Singapore. Then they went on to say, well, no, what exactly does that mean? 
um, and 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 I won't go into the the details, but essentially they say, well, that's that's the general approach. Do a prima facie uh, review, which means you look uh, um, you look at the claim and you probably look at the defense and see whether you know there's anything inherently incredible. Um, if, if there's nothing, it, it should actually in the usual course go for arbitration rather than uh, found a winding up application. But um, I think they built in uh, one important safeguard, which is to say, look, you know, things are, are hardly always so neat in life. And, and um, um, the court then said abuse of process is going to be the control on this because the prima facie standard might in some cases uh, be too low. So they say, well, the court will still look at um, whether there's an abuse of uh, process. And then this is where the position then starts getting a little bit uh, uh, uncertain. But, um, you know, I, I don't think we can have everything so clear because of the, the, the different scenarios in which the issue could arise. So well, what is abuse of process? The Court of Appeal said, well, you know, if you lack good faith, uh, if you lack good faith in opposing the winding up, that's relevant. That probably, that might show abuse of process. Uh, for instance, if um, you have admitted the debt, or you have actually agreed to waive arbitration, then you come to the winding up court and you say, I want arbitration, um, or you, you, you actually are a company that deserves to be wound up. You, you are insolvent, you've got no assets, or you know your directors have made off with your assets, and there is a crying need for an independent court officer to come in. Um, uh, it, it, would be, it might be an abuse of process uh, for the company then to go to court and say, I don't want to winding up, I, I, I insist on the right to arbitrate the debt uh, that the, the applicant uh, has asserted. So in a, in a, in a nutshell, that, 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 was the, that, that is a, a summary of the legal position in Singapore uh, as laid down in An An. And what's interesting is if in the subsequent uh, decision of BWF, the court of appeal then applied, then applied this approach and, and um, came to the conclusion that abuse of process was not shown on the facts of that case. Um, I won't go into the facts of that case. It's actually a very complicated case. There was a, uh, a, a, a web of contracts and the company was somehow just a middleman. They didn't know that the buyer and the, the ultimate buyer and the ultimate seller were the same party. They just signed contracts back to back and they made a, a, made a sum of like 8,000 US dollars and then the whole uh, house of cards came crashing down and uh, they wanted to arbitrate instead of being wound up. And, and um, it was argued in, in BWF that, look, there, there is an abuse of process here because the defenses were inconsistent. Uh, they were taking positions which um, um, they had um, previously not taken and, and so on. But on the facts, the court essentially held, look, you, you know, the company has raised four defenses on the facts. They've raised four defenses. Um, and even if some of the defenses were inconsistent, the abuse of process must infect all four defenses before uh, we are, we are uh, 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 satisfied that this case uh, uh, should proceed for winding up. So, so that gives you an idea of, of where the, the, the threshold, uh, where the threshold is and how the court might apply the approach uh, in future cases. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here, except that I, I do want to make one more point, uh, which is that the Court of Appeal in An An basically said, it does not matter whether the company is disputing the debt or the company is asserting a cross claim against the applicant, right? Um, and, and they said that it is uh, not relevant because I argued that it was relevant. And of course I lost that argument. Um, and, and I just wanted to, to raise that for discussion because um, uh, I, I, I'm, you know, I mean, by definition I'm wrong, but I, I, want, to, I want to just uh, uh, flesh out the argument and, see, and, and invite some thoughts. Uh, because I, I, I made that argument because the metal form case, which was relied upon by the High Court in An An, was a case where the creditor had an undisputed debt based on the supply of goods to the company. 
and the company was asserting a cross claim against the creditor uh, arising out of a different contract with an arbitration agreement. So it wasn't really a case where the company was saying that the applicant was not a creditor. It was a case where the company saying, well, you, yes, you are a creditor, but I've got this claim that I can arbitrate against you. Uh, and, and, and I'm not sure if the analysis is um, the same because uh, the argument can be made that, well, you can arbitrate this claim even if you are in uh, liquidation because you have an undisputed claim. Uh, but of course, the court can always exercise discretion to, to stay the winding up. And, and basically, my, my, you know, the issue is this, is it covered by the general rule that's laid down in Anand or is it more a case of uh, discretion to be exercised uh, uh, on, on the facts of every case where there is a cross claim uh, and the creditor's claim is not the subject of an arbitration agreement. So, um, um, but based on Anand, I, I, I think I probably failed in my duty to sort of flesh out the, the full facts. Um, the Court of Appeal has said that there is no difference whether it is a dispute on the primary debt or it's a cross claim. Now, I, I, I've probably uh, uh, overstayed my welcome, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Eng Bing. That's very, very helpful, uh, this exposition for the, of the case and giving us a general idea of what the Court of Appeal has decided. Um, Shobna, anything to add on your end, being on the other side? Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> Firstly, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, Eng Bing, on the point on uh, the cross claim um, and whether there should be a different test. Uh, I, I, I must respectfully disagree with you and agree with the Court of Appeal <laughs> because uh, that was the position we argued all the way and uh, I didn't see that distinction, but I'm sure a case will come in and that may be tested by the Court of Appeal again. So just picking up on um, a number of points that you made uh, on the abuse of uh, process um, exception. So you had mentioned uh, as well that if the company uh, it, it appears to be insolvent and, and is that if there's a real concern about it, there may well be um, potentially some grounds for uh, uh, the you know, for the for the dispute not to be pushed off to arbitration, and I think I just want to pick up on that because I believe that uh, in our case that wasn't fully explored. There was no report or there was no um, no evidence of real insolvency apart from the debt uh, that our client had put forward. But I'm just uh, wondering, moving forward uh, in these circumstances. Um, considering that where there's an arbitration clause, generally speaking, uh, you would not do a stat demand. Um, you know, there are really two options uh, that, uh, that come to my mind. One would be to go down the balance sheet insolvency test, just leave aside the stat demand, go for proper insolvency and fight it out. And uh, potentially you could do the stat demand, uh, face the challenge, and then bring in some evidence of insolvency, proper evidence, and, and see whether that, that um, you know, bites or the court, the, the court accepts that. But apart from that, um, and obviously the abuse of process exception, uh, which, as you said, is undefined, uh, I think, generally speaking, where you have an arbitration clause, you have a duty to tell the client, really, that uh, you should really just go to arbitration and not try the insolvency route. That's my view, but um, I'll be interested to hear what everyone else thinks, including Ing Bing. Sorry, I, I just I just jumped in there since uh, you're, you're talking about situations where the well, what I said was is a case where the company deserves to be wound up. Uh, I mean, my, my, my own uh, thinking is that it's not going to be that easy uh, to show that uh, the company is, is a company that should be uh, wound up and not have the opportunity to arbitrate the dispute. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a, deeper, there's a deeper conceptual issue with that. Um, assuming that the company is insolvent, does that justify the company being wound up by someone who is not proven to be a creditor? Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, uh, um, so, you know, if, if, if there's an arbitration agreement, it's not been arbitrated, technically, you're not a creditor because mm -hmm. you have subjected yourself to be to be to arbitration. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a there's a bit of a locus standi mm -hmm. issue. So I, I, I think uh, that's why I think that the evidence of um, uh, insolvency and maybe wrongdoing and, and, and what have you in the company must be quite uh, compelling. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just 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 my my uh, my thoughts. Can we have some viewpoints from the Malaysian side? Um, firstly, whether um, is there any position that's been established in Malaysia in relation to winding up applications involving the underlying dispute being subject to arbitration? Is there something? Is there a counterpart similar 
a decision on this for now, or um, is there none? Uh, Robin? Yeah, Angela, um, there, there are a couple of, there are at least two Malaysian uh, High Court decisions, which have ended up in the same place as, as An An, uh, one of which was cited in An An. Uh, but they arrived at that basically by following the English Court of Appeals reasoning in the Salford Estates um, case. Um, and, and where we end up is that um, the, the two courts, both high courts have held that there's no such thing as a winding up petition having to be subject to a mandatory stay under Section 10 of our Arbitration Act. And um, they approached it on the basis that it would be anomalous to have uh, a higher standard applied for purposes of the debtor company disputing the locus of the um, uh, petitioning creditor uh, than in a case where there was no insolvency, no winding up, and the two parties were, were merely arguing a Section 10 stay application, where the standard would be just a prima facie uh, 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 dispute has arisen. So both courts have applied the prima facie uh, approach. And having applied that, they then uh, recognize that the High Court has that discretion, which was exactly the position in Salford Estates in the Court of Appeal in England. Um, it has a discretion to stay or uh, dismiss the, the petition. Um, alternatively, to allow some other creditor to be substituted. All those options are open. In, in the Awang Sabena Mayland Avenue case, which Eng Beng mentioned, which the Singapore Court of Appeal referred to in An An, the uh, judicial commissioner she was at the time actually dismissed the winding up petition. Um, but it's interesting to know that in her judgment right at the end, she approached the matter based on both tests. And she said that if uh, the, the, the standard that had to be shown or reached was that there was a bona fide dispute on the debt on substantial grounds, the respondent that was claiming the right to have this referred to arbitration would have failed on that test. But she felt that the respondent was entitled to the benefit of the prima facie test. And on that approach, uh, she held that there was a cause to not let petition go on, to have it dismissed outright and to require the parties to then arbitrate the underlying um, uh, claim that gave rise to winding up petition. But there's also equally a number of Malaysian cases that have come up where none of the cases like Salford or An An or anything similar to it uh, have been cited, uh, which is a frequent problem with our high courts. Uh, Council sometimes don't cite cases. So the, this other group of um, high court decisions have simply gone on the basis that um, in the face of, a, of an application to stay the winding up petition based on Section 10 of the Arbitration Act, because there is a uh, arbitration agreement in the underlying contract, they have gone on to dismiss the, uh, the stay application and to uh, um, basically deal with the petition on the merits and have largely ordered winding up on the basis that the petitioner cannot pay its debts and there's evidence to that effect. So at the end of the day, uh, I, I think an an will uh, result in more and more parties bringing up this case in the course of their arguments in the High Court in Malaysia. And then it remains to be seen uh, whether or not our High Courts then adopt that approach formally. And, and as I mentioned earlier this afternoon, Singapore decisions are you know, persuasive in Malaysia. Anything else to add, um, Ms. Long? If, uh... Yes, uh, yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with Rabin. Uh, my personal view is that 
if Anan's Court of Appeal Singapore decision is cited to Malaysian judges, uh, the Malaysian Court will follow the rationale in Anan case. Uh, the reason also is because the Malaysian court's jurisprudence is pro-arbitration. They will want to hold, they will say the parties have agreed to an arbitration clause, you must go for arbitration. And, and also a few years ago, the Malaysian parliament has uh, removed the right to set aside an award on the ground of error of law. So basically, the intent is to whole parties to arbitration if they've agreed to an arbitration. So bottom line, I think, uh, as Rabin said, Malaysian judges will apply the lower threshold test, in my view, uh, and stay the court proceeding and refer parties to arbitration. We have a question here from one of the um, audience. Um, the question is, how do you think it will play out in the Anan and BTB decision if it wasn't an arbitration clause, but a foreign exclusive jurisdiction clause? Interesting question. Uh, would any of the panelists like to um, jump in? Okay, that, uh, maybe I can just, just give some comments on that. I, I think that's a very interesting uh, 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 issue. Um, in Singapore, I think the, the Court of Appeals decision in Vinma, uh, uh, um, and that was uh, quoted in An An, um, basically the, 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 the courts here have said that uh, strong cause has to be shown for Singapore proceedings uh, to, be, to, be, uh, uh, to be stayed uh, if there is an exclusive uh, jurisdiction clause. If it is an exclusive jurisdiction clause in favor of another jurisdiction, uh, then I think in, uh, normally it will, it will be stayed. Uh, but I'm not sure whether that applies in relation to winding up proceedings because legal proceedings are not quite the same as winding up proceedings. Um, I think additional considerations come in. Uh, for instance, um, uh, which, uh, in which jurisdiction is the company incorporated in? Where is the place of primary uh, winding up as opposed to secondary uh, 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 liquidation? Um, and there are some public interest considerations uh, that come in uh, uh, as well. So let me try and, 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 and see, you know, if, if in Anan -An there was an exclusive jurisdiction clause for the resolution of the dispute elsewhere, and VTB then uh, tries to wind up uh, um, uh, the company in Singapore. Uh, I don't think that, uh, I, I think the, the correct analysis at this, uh, 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 according to the present state of the law, would rather, would be to uh, probably to attack the locus standi issue rather than to, to say, well, you know, um, uh, because it, it's a winding up, it's a winding up application, um, and basically, what the company should do is to start proceedings in the foreign jurisdiction where there's an exclusive jurisdiction clause in favor of, and then say that the local standard issue is being litigated elsewhere pursuant to an exclusive jurisdiction clause, and and I think that that's the approach that uh, uh, should be taken. So not not quite uh, on all fours with uh, Annan, but uh, interesting scenario. Sorry, uh, just, just to add, I, I think on the exclusive jurisdiction, Andrew Chan, um, partly that might depend on whether the parties, are, if you like, um, if you like, have their place of business, basically whether the choice of court conventions actually applies. Because for it, where you go to countries or where you have parties from jurisdictions where the convention actually applies, there's actually a sort of a mandatory stay or that the court cannot refuse jurisdiction. I think the same test was still applied because the point about the prima facie test is essentially this, there is something which is to be arbitrated and what have you. If, that, if you don't even hit that threshold, I mean, that might be an escape route out of the convention, but the convention actually dictates that chosen court because to actually determine that particular matter. And there are very few exceptions when you can get out of it. Although it does not apply to insolvency proceedings, but the point is that the very dispute itself is going to be subject to the convention. So the extent is subject to the convention and the rules relation to the convention, unless you can find yourself doing the exception, I think the convention will prevail. And to that particular extent, I think the same decision or result vis-a-vis -vis an -an can also be achieved for those exclusive jurisdiction clauses for which the convention applies. Thank you, Andrew. While I have you, 
I thought I would just move on to the next question for you where uh, I just, I'm just curious if you have any, um, having heard from the other panelists about the positions taken by the Singapore courts and the Malaysian courts, uh, what are your thoughts? Is it better to pursue a claim in an insolvency process by a proof of debt or refer to arbitration? What are your thoughts? Can I ask my Abang Besar from Malaysia to speak first, uh, Mr. Leong? Which one? <laughs> Uh, Andrew, I'll just give my uh, Mr. Leong. Yes, I'll give my short answer and then you can wrap it up for me. I think the short answer is I don't know the answer because uh, in Malaysia, uh, as I said, uh, we only have high court decision on uh, whether it's arbitrable or not. So it, it will be a very bold lawyer to say go for arbitration, uh, you know, and then uh, you know because really we are only at the high court stage as it is in the Udaland case. So, but assuming that you do want to go for arbitration, right, right, uh, because you want to establish your claim, uh, especially if, if you're a liquidator of a, a, a main contractor and you've got money to claim, then of course you need to get leave of court under the Malaysian Companies Act. The Malaysian court has established that uh, leave is required even for arbitration. And the leave has to be applied from the court that granted the winding up order. So I'm not sure whether the position is uh, similar in, in Singapore on this, but really in Malaysia at this stage, whether a party should go for arbitration or just file proof of that, uh, it is still in a state of flux as far as the arbitrability issue is concerned. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Wai Hong. Um, just in case the joke was lost, when I was referring to Abang Besar translation means bigger brother, I was referring to Wai Hong. I was not referring to Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, those of you who know the context of that joke, uh, it's only Malaysians who understand that joke, okay? So I was referring to the person, not the country. Now, to me, like, this contest between the court and the, uh, if you like, the insolvency proceeding, let me break this down to four principles. I mean, the first point that assumes you have a choice. If it's not arbitrable, it's not within the arbitration agreement or the arbitration agreement is null void and incapable of being performed or something like that, that choice does not arrive. So that is all A, you know, relating to the arbitration agreement and arbitrability. I will say the first of four principles is A. The second principle is C, in case you think I'm very conceited, A, C, Andrew Chan. So the second principle is C. Let me tell you the, the C principle, cost. Because when you look at costs, you must examine the question from this context. When you are suing and you are being sued, where the liquidator is suing or on behalf of the company, or it is a situation where on the, the flip side, that someone wants to bring a claim. We need to examine this question or see costs in both ways. For example, if the company sues and pursues arbitration, David raises the point whether before and after, where, when you commence. But in one sense, they are, there's Hong Kong authority to the fact that if the arbitrate if the company chooses to pursue an arbitration because they have to pursue an arbitration if, if it's if there's a particular claim i mean they can't go to court because they'll be stayed in that pursuit if they were to lose the, there is clear and it means that the company were to lose the claim which is against the defendant assuming the defendant gets cost it's a priority claim which means and not only that i think by logical extension even though there's no, no case that's gone so far, which I can ascertain, the estate cost rule should apply in its fullest form, meaning to say, not only would be the defendant's cost be a priority cost, if there's not enough, the, the liquidator may also be personal liable. So those dictate a choice. If you want to sue, you bear in mind, you might actually have cost consequences. The flip side is, of course, where the claimant, the other side actually sues. Where the other side actually sues, the considerations, obviously there's a stay. Obviously the cheaper methodology is to actually, you know, determine the proof of debt and what have you, for which you can then have an appeal. This is where, again, some people think that just because it's a proof of debt, that's the end and the be all. It is not. On When you look at costs, if I want, you bring a claim, I want to bring a cross claim, I may be subject to escape cost rule. But, and, if, however, you bring a claim, meaning some other creditor brings a claim or claimant brings a claim, it's been determined in, in arbitration, and then you appeal, there is a protective rule that says appeal on determinations of adjudications on proof of debt, liquidator not personally liable. So that's protection in one particular sense. So I may have cross claims or what have you, bringing it into arbitration, uh, bringing it into insolvency proceeding adjudication has a protective mechanism. And just to continue that particular discussion, interestingly, in the decision in, in, in Australia called Tanning, if you appeal the decision, 
from the adjudication, that's also capable of being arbitrated. So don't think just because you go to adjudication, that's the end of the matter. But in that sense, when you actually appeal because and proceed to arbitration, my view is the same protective provision which protects the liquidator from cost consequence contemplate. I have many more things to say on the C principle, but we must begin to think about AC. But in case you think I'm very conceited, let me talk about other interests. And then there's a third principle, interest I. All right, so it's a, I'm not just thinking about myself, I'm thinking about broader interests. If there are other interests, then that's important. For example, if I need to unlock a performance bond or a guarantee which is given because it only responds to an arbitration agreement or award, then there's nothing I can do. I mean, I go against the company, I'm not going to get a right against a third party, the service provider. Or if I've arrested a vessel, I've got, if you like, a bond which or guarantee which is available, only which can be unlocked in arbitration. These are where interests are different. Or if I have a situation where I'm suing the company in liquidation, plus I'm suing others as well, all parties, you need to bring them. So where your interests are different, that is a situation where you would say arbitration must be allowed to trump the normal insolvency proceedings. So, S. And the last category, so I have, if you like, A, C, and I. The last principle which I leave is S, special reasons. If there's something more, for example, there's expertise, there's something, or it's a tail end of arbitration, you just want to complete the last bit rather than try to adjudicate and whatever, because there may be cost consequences in terms of SCA court rules. So four principles, special reason, S, I, interest, A, arbitrability, arbitration agreement, etc. A, and C, cost. The SIAC principles, special reason, interest, arbit agreement, arbitrability, and cost. SIAC principles well are done, four Andrew. considerations. <laughs> well done. We should have an award for you for that. <laughs> like, a, like a prize award, not like a arbitration award. I'm just kidding. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's fantastic. Uh, it's very, very practical. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, as well from the Malaysian side. Um, I mean, Rabin earlier mentioned the case of Arch Reinsurance, where it's a very interesting federal court case. Um, uh, I mean, Rabin can, can give us more details further, but um, I think as far as I understand, it is um, strictly speaking, uh, not directly related to a uh, winding up proceeding on insolvency per se, but it is a statutory um, related relief and it's tied in with a, with a Stay of application, stay application to refer to arbitration in SIAC. Maybe Robin can give us a bit more exposure on that and tell us what what it is about and its effect. Yeah, um, thanks, Angela. The Arch Reinsurance case uh, had to do with uh, foreclosure proceedings under our national land code, so it's very far removed from um, winding up petitions. Um, but on the other hand, a decision of the federal court on Section four of our Arbitration Act on and on what is arbitrable is always going to be very important um, for Malaysian practitioners in, in, in particular. Um, so just, just very quickly uh, to run through the what happened in that case. Basically, uh, this involved the issuance of bonds. There was a subscription agreement and the appellant was the investor that subscribed for the bonds the respondent was the, the issuer. The respondent had created security in the form of a national land code charge over a mining lease, uh, which was basically it, what the company carried on by way of, of business. So the long and the short of it is that the uh, respondent issuer failed to redeem the bonds uh, when the time came. And instead, it went around looking for ways of selling the mining lease. Um, it alleged that the appellant um, holder of the bonds had had agreed to extend the time uh, for it to find a buyer. So um, the, the appellant, on the other hand, said, you didn't redeem my bonds. I'm going to uh, effectively uh, foreclose on the security which I have which is the charge over the mining lease. And that means it commenced an originating summons for an order for sale under our National Land Code 1965. The respondent issuer applied for a stay under Section 10 of the Arbitration Act on the basis that the subscription agreement uh, between these two parties had a 
as you said earlier, an SIAC arbitration provision. And in fact, it also uh, provided that the, the subscription agreement itself uh, was subject to Singapore law. Um, and, and therefore, had there been an arbitration under the subscription agreement, Singapore law would have been the, the, the law applicable to the substance of the dispute. Uh, but on the other hand, the National Land Code charge has an annexure to it. The statutory form has an annexure. The annexure uh, provided for Malaysian law to apply and for a, a court-based uh, dispute resolution process. So the federal court also took that into account. But, but essentially, the, the decision uh, ran along the following lines. We start off with Section 4 of the Arbitration Act. Uh, 4.1 says that as long as the parties have agreed to refer any dispute to arbitration, it can be referred, except uh, where the arbitration agreement um, is somehow contrary to public policy. And then 4.2, section 4, subsection 2 says, the fact that a court uh, is specifically conferred jurisdiction under any written law, and that would include the National Land Code and the High Court in this case, uh, does not mean that the dispute is not capable of being referred to arbitration. So that, just pausing here for a minute, that would apply to the High Court, which is specifically the court that is conferred jurisdiction under the NLC to grant orders for sale. It could also, in theory, apply to the High Court in its winding up uh, jurisdiction as well, because it's conferred jurisdiction under the Companies Act to uh, wind up companies, uh, obviously. Then the federal court went on to say, well, look at Larson. Um, it would, you need to determine arbitrability because it's a waste of time to allow the process to go all the way to award only to find that when you come back, the award should be set aside because subject matter is never arbitrable in the, in the first place. So the federal court referred to the Singapore Court of Appeals decision in, in the Tomo, Tomo Lungan case, if I pronounced it correctly, uh, that there's a presumption of arbitrability. Um, did parliament, in, there will be a presumption unless it can be said parliament didn't intend a particular type of dispute to be referred to arbitration uh, or public policy would not allow such a claim to be resolved by, by arbitration. And for a whole host of reasons which are peculiar to National Land Code, um, the court held that the uh, uh, foreclosure action under the National Land Code is simply not a dispute that can be referred to uh, arbitration. Uh, amongst other things, the, it is a statutory form of action. It involves a statutory instrument, not a contract. Uh, therefore, the arbitration agreement in any contract forming part of the matrix of the claim is not relevant. Um, there is no way of contracting out of it. Uh, the, the dispute is only about whether or not the, the charger has defaulted on the statutory notice in, in Form 16D. Um, and since the NLC is a comprehensive statute dealing with, on a code-like basis, dealing with land law in Malaysia, you just couldn't uh, escape going through the, uh, that process. So that was basically the decision there. Robbie, when I, when I was reading the decision as well, I'm just curious, um, you've mentioned one of the grounds for the federal court decision is that um, because it's a comprehensive statutory um, relief, therefore they could not see as a, they could not deal with it as an arbitrable matter. Do you think the same consideration would be applied to a process like the winding up process, or is that a too superficial way to look at it? No, I, I think that's a good point that you've raised, and I think this is where the nature of uh, a foreclosure proceeding under the National Land Code is important to bear in mind. Um, one of the things the, court, the, the, the federal court said was, look at what is actually an issue in, in a National Land Code foreclosure action. Our courts for the past 20 to 30 years have held that whether or not the chargee has breached some other obligation, whether it's under a loan agreement, or in this case, a subscription agreement is irrelevant to the 
um, the foreclosure action. You can deal with that separately, uh, either in a court or if you if you have an arbitration agreement in an arbitration. In a foreclosure action, the court is only concerned with a very, very narrow compass. Um, is the charge valid? Uh, has the chargee defaulted? Uh, are there any other considerations that might be caused to the contrary to not allow a sale of this land? But it has nothing to do with the substantive uh, breaches that are alleged uh, as regards the, the chargee's um, uh, use of the security in the first place. It's got nothing to do with that. So in that sense, it is far more limited, and I don't think it would be uh, it would it would de deprive a high court. Uh, judge of the ability to say that although the Companies Act has a lot of provisions that deal with winding up, that it is so comprehensive that you cannot have any matter that might come under High Court judges' jurisdiction uh, precluded from going to arbitration. So that's how I would I would see it. Thanks, Robin. That's very interesting. Uh, and thanks for sharing that. It's it's a it's a very interesting case, and and I'm I'm grateful for your view. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, to the next stage, we were talking about the effect of insolvency on a claim that a party would like to bring, and we, we talked about the considerations to bear in mind whether to go for POD process or do we go for arbitration. Now let's move on to the next stage where we look at the effect of insolvency on ongoing arbitration proceedings. So we're looking at a bit more procedural here. Um, perhaps I could invite David to, to give his view on um, when, there, when a party is undergoing insolvency proceedings in arbitration, um, must, must the arbitration be state? What are some of the considerations involved uh, if you're a party to that arbitration? I think that very much depends on whether I'm acting for the claimant or acting for the liquidator or the insolvency professional. <laughs> I mean, of, of course, of course, um, moratorium that applies to creditor actions applies to arbitrations. Um, I've tried to argue that it doesn't apply in the previous case, um, but it, um, I think it's quite clear that it does apply. And uh, that Arbitration is indeed a proceeding that um, has to be uh, forestalled for, in order to give the company or the distressed company space and time to rehabilitate and to find its way um, to, to restructure itself. Um, I, I think the difficulty always is persuading the court that fine, it is, it is, it is very well to give the company that space but as a creditor, I still need to mark my own rights, my own position with regard to my claim. And that typically applies especially, I mean, the, there was a whole list, well, I won't say a whole list, there were three considerations set out by Justice Aidan Abdullah and High Flux. Um, but we're not going into the, the, the details of that, like, because I think the, the, the principal um, consideration I would think is that, um, if one has, for example, a proprietary claim, or the claimant or the creditor has a proprietary claim, and whether how that then affects where he stands, whether with or whether he stands with the unsecured creditors, or whether he stands with the secured creditors, whether in fact the monies that are being held on trust for him, for example, are being used to rehabilitate the company and pay off the creditors, that's also another consideration. And would the court then, in those circumstances, say, Okay, I think maybe if I don't allow this to proceed, will the monies then be used? Will your put will potentially your monies then be used to pay off the creditors for a basu, which is not may not necessarily be the distressed companies' monies that are being used. I mean, th there are several different considerations. Um, what I mentioned earlier on, and I think I should put up my hand because I I, I when when Ingbing mentioned earlier about um, insolvency having a much, much longer history than arbitration. Um, it's very true. And I, I think from a practitioner's point of view, um, 
it has also slipped my mind that there is indeed that interaction. There is indeed, for example, the issue of what is arbitrable and what is not arbitrable. And I, I don't know whether Rabin and, and Wai Hong, whether this would give any comfort that Malaysia's High Court did not really consider the concept of arbitrability, I think, from what I understand. Um, but when, when we did last and, and the Court of Appeals decision actually refers to it, that arbitrability was never raised in the High Court. It was only raised in the Court of Appeal. And, and I suppose this is where, like I said, I mean, it, it never occurred to me 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and like what Aiming said, that there was that arbitration and insolvency um, are very much interlinked. But, and that, that realization has only, I think, come across in more recent years, or certainly after Larson. Um, now, this is something that I mentioned at the start of, um, of the webinar when I talked about filing approved debts and the tension between filing approved debts and, and, and continuing with the arbitration or permitting to be commence an arbitration. Um, so one of the issues, of course, is that if I were to go down the route of allowing the insolvency professional, whether it's a liquidator or a judicial manager, um, to adjudicate my proof, there are certain rights which he is unable to give me, for example. He's, for example, unable to say that or, or grant a declaration, which I may be seeking over in respect of certain um, proprietary claims. Um, which I can only get, for example, from a, an award. And I think these are all matters which one can raise in terms of trying to persuade the court that the arbitration should continue notwithstanding uh, the moratorium. I, 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 I can't say that these are exhaustive. I can't say that if you raise these issues, they will necessarily be successful. Um, all I can say is that I've tried and I've failed on some, some occasions and I've um, prevailed on some occasions. But I think um, the point, I think, must be that um, if, if there is indeed, it is, well, I think the point must be that you must first recognize that there is indeed a tension. There is indeed a tension between how your claim is to be adjudicated whether it's by way of the formal or informal process, or whether it's by way of arbitration, and how that then fits in with um, how you are treated in the insolvency or the restructuring of the distressed company. Does anyone else have any comments to add on? I mean, I, I think it is uh, clear that there's a tension um, but I'm wondering if there has been any trends or any inclination, either from a Singapore court or Malaysia side, um, whether would the courts typically allow such a stay of arbitration? Will they order such a stay of arbitration um, if there is an insolvency proceeding filed? And a further consideration to that is what happens when a Singapore court uh, uh, insolvency proceeding is commenced in a Singapore court and a moratorium is, is made um, in reference to a Malaysian arbitration, a Malaysian seated arbitration. What are some of these, um, what are some of the, your views, I suppose, um, on um, how it Angela, would affect the progress? Yeah. Yeah, Angela, could I, could I just share something uh, which, which um, may, may be relevant? Um, uh, next Friday, I'll, I'll be arguing an appeal in the Singapore Court of Appeal. Um, and, and I think the, the decision is going to be important to both Malaysian and Singapore practitioners. This is a case where uh, there is a Singapore, it's, it's not arbitration, but it applies, it would apply to arbitrations as well. There's a jurisdiction clause for the dispute to be litigated in Singapore. Um, but um, so, so I'm, I'm acting for Singapore party. The Malaysian party is a, a Malaysian company incorporated uh, here and they have gone into liquidation in Malaysia. And what has happened is that the Malaysian company has applied to the Singapore court under the, the um, cross-border insolvency, uh, 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 the model law. 
on cross-border insolvency for the liquidation in Malaysia to be recognized and then uh, to ask the Singapore court for a stay of the Singapore proceedings. Um, and, and that could be done in a case where there's an arbitration uh, in Singapore. Um, and, and we will see whether the Singapore court will indeed stay the Singapore proceedings, whether court proceedings or uh, arbitration on account of a cross-border insolvency where a Malaysian litig litigation, uh, sorry, a Malaysian liquidation is recognized under the model law in Singapore. And, and I, I think that, that that will set an important, uh, that, that, that will show quite uh, 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 what, what, what uh, inclination the Singapore courts have. I think there's some Singapore, uh, there's a Singapore case where, where the Singapore Court of Appeal has, has already said they might stay Singapore proceedings, but only in cases where Singapore is not the proper forum. So um, where Singapore is the proper forum by reason of an arbitration agreement, or by way of an exclusive or non-exclusive jurisdiction clause, I, I think um, the, 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 the jury is still out. So um, that, that's one context in which the, the, the issue could arise. Thank you, so, Ming. Uh, yes. can, I, can I just add, I think the, the, this issue has not really arise in, in Malaysian court, but I think when it comes to whether recognition of foreign uh, monitoring orders in respect of insolvency proceedings will be recognized. I think you have a tension between uh, two principles, which is whether the company concern uh, is uh, comes from the is incorporated in the country itself, or it comes within the combi principle center of main interests. So this 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 tension uh, was actually uh, considered recently by the Hong Kong court, very recently uh, in Lam Tax case and the. The, Singapore, the Hong Kong court actually followed the Singapore High Court decision of optimetics and they held that they, they will look at and give priority to the company's center of main interest, the Kormi principle. And in fact, in that Hong Kong case, they proceeded to wind up the company despite uh, so-called moratorium order uh, granted by an offshore jurisdiction where the company was incorporated. So the this Hong Kong court held that those uh, offshore incorporated company are actually just letterbox jurisdiction. That's what the single, uh, European Court of Justice called those. So they don't really recognize that. They will look at it only as a default jurisdiction. So priority will be to the common uh, jurisdiction. So I'm not sure whether in being this tension will be actually explored in your case next week. I better prepare harder. Yeah, why, why don't I do yes, this? I, I, yeah, I, I'm going to tax you all a bit more by giving you another an acronym. I, I'm going to set this as general principles, bearing in mind. So this is how I'm going to tax you. I'm going to tell you about CESS, a form of tax, CES. Okay, these are the general principles. Central main interest, because under the model law and now also the common law, which seems to be, if it is, if it is, an insolvency emanating from the center of main interest then, and if it's actually recognized in Singapore, then under the model law, there's an automatic stay on the basis of similar to winding up. So in that sense, it might actually stay arbitration as well. But of course, on individual cases, the court might say, you know, I, I make exceptions or what have you. So it's a center of main interest, insolvency emanating from there, recognized here, likely there'll be a stay as a start position subject to individual circumstances. That is C. E, if it's an establishment, under the model law, if it's, it is not the center of main interest, and that's not the nerve center, main place you deal with creditors and what have you, then establishment, then I think it may be recognized, but whether or not the courts will grant a stay here in recognition of our insolvency and a place of, if you like, establishment or what have you, very much like what Wai Hong says, especially if Singapore itself was the center of main interest and foreign insolvency and, and there's no proceedings here, I, I think the courts will likely not prevent rights here. In other words, if it is the as from the establishment, or in some from establishment, I think the court has more, a lot more flexibility compared to the first instance. S, what is S? S is that while the, there is a common, but while there's a model law, the results in a remaining question is to what extent does common law still exist? At common law, 
there was a possibility of an argument that you are subject to foreign insolvency on the submission doctrine. You participated. Cambridge Gas is one such case where there was a submission doctrine. If the submission doctrine still actually applies, then that may be another basis on which we give recognition, not because you know we necessarily recognize a whole insolvency, but because an individual creditor or claimant submitted to the jurisdiction. So the submission doctrine is the third. Uh, so CES, Central Main Interest, Establishment, Submission. The fourth S is this. What I call, when you look at moratorium, what have you, that's only a technique to actually stall or put an end or stop if like proceedings here. What if the four, the S, my last S is what I call the substantive law or substantive determination. If the foreign uh, scheme or the foreign process actually substantively defeated your claim, substantively compromised your claim, will we give effect to that? So things like that. So, or if it was the law of the proper, if you like the proper law, and that insolvency happened there, that compromised or, or extinguished the claim. So by the proper law rule or by a participation in a foreign insolvency, your substantive claim can actually be affected. So four ways, central main interest, prima facie easier than normally have a state establishment, big question. Uh, if you like the third one, essentially the submission doctrine, does it still apply a common law? As far as we're concerned, four possibilities, substantive effects. Those are four methods for which foreign insolvency might impact arbitration in Singapore. The SES principles, and I'll leave you having taxi Thank you, Andrew. I wish I could come up with acronyms like that in, in just a moment like that. <laughs> But with that, I will have to um, sadly announce that our time is up. Um, we, we do, I do have, still have some more, so many questions to ask these very good panelists, but uh, unfortunately we can't go on. But of course, um, we want to thank all the speakers today um, for their very, very valuable contribution. Uh, Inbing, I hope you haven't uh, disclosed any of your arguments for your, uh, for your court of appeal matter next week. I, uh, I hope it all goes well. Yeah, I haven't prepared my arguments. <laughs> All right, okay, fantastic. I hope this this gets you started somewhat. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I'll hand it back to you, Suen. Thank you, Angela. Thank you all for that very interesting and insightful session. Please spare some time to complete the feedback form um, after this webinar. We hope to see everyone at our future SIP events. Have a lovely evening and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.